Christmas is a season for giving, and we all know that it is much more blessed to give than to receive. Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. Our opening hymn is Kumbaya, so I ask that you please rise as you are able for the singing of this hymn and remain standing for the prayer of invocation and all praying the Lord's Prayer. Let us join in prayer with an attitude of gratefulness. Almighty and ever-loving God, in whom we live, move, and have being, we are grateful for the experience of expressing life and to be able to express more fully as we choose. May we, during this season of Advent, choose to elevate our consciousness to truly understand the words that we sing, the words that we speak, and to listen more closely to the guidance that we are given from divine mind, that we may bring into manifestation the abundance of healing, joy, love, acceptance, and giving, that we may complete that circle and give all of that out to all creation as they give to others around them. And each time that it is given, we know it goes to the source of all life. For this knowledge and wisdom, we are eternally grateful. So we ask this day that we be able to give each person that we encounter the freedom to realize and evaluate where they are without our judgment or condemnation but allowing each one to be that which they come here to express, to learn, to experience, and become. Let us affirm this by praying the prayer the Master Teacher Jesus taught the disciples. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and leave us not in temptation but deliver us from error for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen thank you and please be seated at this time, we will declare the principles of the United Metaphysical Churches, which is the foundation of our belief system, which leads us to a greater depth and understanding of the parables and the truths contained in the Bible and other sacred texts. We believe in God as infinite intelligence. We believe that the phenomena of nature, both physical and spiritual, are the expression of infinite intelligence. We affirm that a correct understanding of such expression and living in accordance therewith constitute true religion. We believe in personal responsibility and that we create our own happiness or unhappiness as we live in harmony or discord with natural, physical, and spiritual laws. We affirm that the existence and the personal identity of the individual continues after leaving the physical world. We affirm that communication with spirit is a natural experience and is demonstrated through mediumship. We affirm that examples of prophecy and healing found in the Bible and other sacred texts are divine attributes found in all people. We believe that the highest morality is contained in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We affirm that the doorway to reformation is always open to any soul here or hereafter. Our special music today is the 12 days of Christmas. And I ask that you listen to this song carefully and see where that takes you. And then afterwards, as we come to understand the true meaning of this song, 
we will know how much we have expanded our consciousness today. It is obvious that God is the one true love, the creator of all, and therefore bestows upon us that bounty. Not just one day, but every day. And as we come to understand and unfold the gifts of spirit, which are exemplified in the other gifts that are given, we too understand how to give of all that bounty to others that we seek. We do not have to deplete ourselves 
in order to give because that supply is continuous. We just need to learn to use that in service to others by serving God, by serving humanity. That's how we elevate ourselves. That's how we bring healing. We manifest abundance. And yes, even those that have gone to the other side, we remember them as to who we come to realize they were to us before they depart. And then as they gain in wisdom and knowledge from the other side, they find a way to come back and make their presence known, giving us that love, acceptance, and uplifting. So it is a complete cycle of giving and receiving, which never stops. So it is up to us to acknowledge that abundance, the gifts, the joy, and to lavish those on others as we experience and embody uplifting ourselves to that place that we desire to go. So maintain that thought and that vibration throughout the service today. And after the lights come up, feel free to open your eyes. Our service uh, scripture today is Matthew 18, 21 and 22. And the title of our lecture is the 12 days of Christmas. Peter came up and said to him, my Lord, if my brother is at fault with me, how many times should I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times 77. That is a lot of forgiveness. And that leads us to the wisdom that Christmas is the season for giving and forgiveness is the gift that keeps on giving to the receiver and to the giver. We know that it is more blessed to give than receive, and this is especially true with forgiveness. True forgiveness comes from the heart, and the act of forgiving activates within us the state of being forgiven. As parents, there comes a time when each of us have to face the truth about Santa Claus like the dad whose son came to him and said, Dad, I think I'm old enough now to know the truth about Santa. Is there a Santa Claus? Well, the father agreed that his son was old enough, but he said to him, before I tell you, I have a question for you. You see, the truth is a dangerous gift to give to anyone. Once you know something, you can't unknow it. So there is a great responsibility to truth. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we find ourselves living a lie. Once you know the truth about Santa Claus, you will never again understand and relate to him as you do now. So are you sure that you really want to know? After a brief pause, the son replied, yes, I choose to know. The dad said Santa is real, but he is not an old man with a beard and a red suit. That's what we tell kids. Kids are too young to understand the true nature of Santa Claus, so we explain it to them in a way that they can understand. The truth is, Santa is not a person at all. He's an idea. All the presents you received over the years, I actually bought myself as a gift to you. You see, Santa Claus is the idea of giving without thought of thanks or acknowledgement from the receiver. When I saw that lady collapse on the subway last week and called for help, I knew she would never know that it was me that summons the ambulance for her to get treatment. I was being Santa 
when I did that. Now that you know that part of it, that means you can never tell a young child a secret and you have to help us select Santa presents for them. And most important, you have to look for opportunities to help people that need it. He looked at his son and said, got it? Forgiveness is a process that remains, reminds me of the song, The Twelve Days of Christmas. The first time I heard the song, it made absolutely no sense. It was so crazy that I chose to listen to it again immediately. The second time I thought the song was a love story of a young man trying to impress his true love. But then after all, what does leaping lords, French hens, swimming swans, or a partridge in a pear tree have to do with spirituality? I was very <coughs> stubborn, you know, being my true self, because I question some, sometimes to a degree too far. Who do you know that would give someone the gift of a partridge in a pear tree, then return the following day with another partridge in a pear tree and two turtle doves? At the end of 12 days, you would have 12 partridges, 22 turtle doves, 27 French hens, plus 32 calling birds. What man do you know after being rejected that many times would keep coming back with the same gift he gave you the day before, plus six geese or even seven swans? So that holds no water. My research revealed that from 1858 until 1829, a period of 271 years, Roman Catholics in England were not permitted to practice their faith openly. During that era, someone wrote this carol as a catechism, which the young children could remember and use it openly to celebrate their faith. Like many texts, it has meaning on more than one level. The literal story plus a hidden meaning knowing only to the members of the church during that period of time. Each element in the Christmas carol is a code, a word, or symbol for a religious reality. The partridge in a pear tree symbolizes Jesus Christ. The two turtle doves, the Old and the New Testaments. Three French hens symbolize faith, hope, and love. The four calling birds represent the four gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The five golden rings represent the Torah known as the law, which is the, five, the first five books of the Old Testament. Six geese a laying symbolizes the six days of creation. Seven swans a swimming symbolize the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, mercy, contribution, and leadership. Eight maids a milking symbolize the eight beatitudes. Nine ladies dancing the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness. The ten lords a leaping symbolize the ten commandments. The eleven pipers piping symbolize the eleven faithful disciples. The twelve drummers drumming symbolize the twelve points of belief in the Apostles' Creed. With this knowledge, I listened to the song again. And it became crystal clear to me that the one true love is God, not the love story of two human beings. And the first gift, the partridge in a pear tree, represents Jesus the Christ, or Christ consciousness, a state of being which allows the individual to progressively utilize all the gifts of spirit without impeding our own current level of progression. In fact, utilizing these gifts help us perfect that within our own being. And this is what Jesus was telling the disciples in Luke chapter 9, verses 58, when he said, Foxes have holes, 
Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Here, Jesus is reminding us that as human beings, sons of man, we are evolving souls. And as such, we have no fixed final resting place in the universe. Every state of being, our state of consciousness place we find ourselves in, is in divine order with the state of consciousness in which it was created. Therefore, we must evolve to resolve the current issues that are taking place in our lives each and every day. We are learning, growing, expanding units of consciousness with a yearning to know more of God, infinite intelligence, divine mind, that we may better know ourselves and experience fully the essence of being. Alexandra F. Jenkins wrote a poem that speaks to the essence of one's being. And since Advent is a time of preparation, of forgiving and letting go, shifting our individual consciousness, I would like to share this poem with you at this time. And it begins, What am I? Born am I. I am what I am. A soul immortal garbed as man, as much of God as God I know, as much of man as man I show, component with the life I share, my debt to all none can complete. My debt to parents, kith and kin, reach far beyond my inmost sight. My debt to friends who helped me all, by word or thought, each gave me life. My debt to books, with all their wealth, to nature with her power to teach, to science with her skyward sweep, my debt to foes, they made me strong, to love that tempered and reconciled, to death so called that gave me birth. I owe myself to God and to life. We learned that knowledge, not sacrifice, is the savior of the world. It was the life of Jesus, not his death, death that demonstrated the potential of any individual quickened with, with divine mind. Through unconditional love, Jesus taught and demonstrated forgiveness. Forgiveness is the act of forgiving, or the state of being forgiven and the law of compensation mets out to each individual the appropriate payment for our own acts, whether they be good, bad, or indifferent. Whatever the case, this law automatically exerts itself and we get back exactly what we give out. Emerson defines it as payment for service rendered or injury suffered. There are times when we do not adequately understand this law. Often we hear people say, I see people transgressing the law are simply are, are sinning daily. And there seems to be no consequences for their actions. They seem to just continue to gain wealth and live life to the fullest. And here I am doing everything right and everything seems to go all wrong. There are two errors in thinking this way. The first is, this is negative thinking, thinking and it donates negativity. So negativity begets negativity. And the second is the law does not require that we see the payment another receives for his or her deeds. In, in fact, it is none of our business even if we were once the injured party by that individual. The law of retribution teaches us essentially the same thing. What one sows, one must reap. However, the law of equity, that is the law of giving, teaches, gives to each of us our just rewards. Justice does prevail, whether we see it materialize or not. It does not matter whether we agree with this or whether we are even aware of it. Undoubtedly, the law of equity and trust 
is to equip each of us with a moral philosophy that will stand the test of every assault that can ever be made upon it. So until we get the message, we can still expect to keep getting lessons, harsh lessons each and every day. But once we gain that understanding and live within that law, we can stop that cycle of repetitiveness from happening. Each of us receives according to what we have done. That's why it is vitally important for us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us because it will be done back to us. The law of karma, especially in philosophic thought, has become closely linked with the law of cause and effect. Again, we must remember that as we sow, so must we reap. Karma, if properly understood, can at least give meaning to the retribution we have to make and to the compensation that we receive. Eventually, we come to understand that life presents us with two choices, evolve or repeat, not repent. Every action has a karmic reaction, but we are free to choose our own actions, even through adherence of karma. They say that we are currently living under karmic debts from the past, but we are still free to choose how we will meet and how we will choose to pay off those debts. The freedom of will prevails under karma but we cannot live in harmony with the law of love if another individual is at fault with us for something that we have done. It impedes our ability to receive. We choose a small... When this occurs, we actually close a small portion of our heart and with each event that the ego is not willing to forgive, let go of, we feel unworthy and unloved. Many times we feel alone and desperate. We experience a state of lack, which leads to experiences of jealousy, hate, resentment, and even physical illness, unless we choose to correct our way of thinking and feeling. It is easy to blame others for the sad state of affairs in our personal lives, rather than take responsibility for what we have created either consciously or unconsciously, and look within to see what or who we need to forgive. Taking the appropriate action to restore peace, harmony, health, and happiness in our own lives. We can begin that journey by praying. Dear God, please enlighten that which is dark in me. Strengthen that which is weak in me and mend what is broken in me. When we fix ourselves, we do not see as much darkness in the rest of the world because we know that within each individual there is a way to bring resolution and closure to these events. I guess I'm summing it up by saying we need to face our karmic debt. Find a way through our actions within us to break that connection, be able to forgive ourselves. And when we remove that ego aspect, we will be able to forgive others. And until we do, we will not accept the season of Christmas nor receive those things in the way that they are meant to be received by the world. Then when we look at our Christmas to-do list that consists of buying, wrapping presents, sending the gifts off through the mail, and shopping for that special food for the Christmas Day meal, we should include wrapping humanity in a hug, sending peace and healing to the world, striving to see the best in all people, nurturing everyone, physically and spiritually. We do not have to be up in their face sharing our truth. 
we can send this to them in the same manner that, that God, the giver and creator of all, sends it to us mentally. People receive these impressions, whether they have the awareness of it or not. Sometimes they actually act upon it without realizing where the stimulation or the courage came from. During the 12 days of Christmas, as we stuff our stockings, wrap the presents for those who are near and dear to our own hearts, attuning our ears to the wordless music of the spheres, our hearts reach out like a flower seeking the sun for the truth, as a million unseen hands that have been waiting reach down to help us elevate our consciousness to a level where we know that we truly are souls immortal, garbed as man, with a conscious awareness that God is not only with us throughout this journey, but has been within us all of this time. An awakening to this truth is what the Advent season is about. And there is no greater gift to give to the world or to us ourselves than to place ourselves in that state to let go and let God and birth that Christ within us this Christmas morning. Namaste.